Hi, I'm Mark Ray, and welcome to Honourable Mentions, a podcast where each episode, a special guest will talk to me about a video game that, for whatever reason, doesn't quite make their all-time list, but really does deserve special praise. I've got a confession to make. I was having such a good time talking with our guest on this episode, I completely forgot my hosting responsibilities at the end of our chat, and forgot to ask them if they had any projects they'd like to promote. So, to right this wrong, I'm going to let you know right here at the top of the show that I'm chatting with the delightful Mr. James Carter. You may know him as one of the hosts of, in my opinion, the best video games podcast to come out of the UK, Kane and Rinse. But, you may not be as aware that James also hosts a side project podcast called Retrofit, which is... Well, I'll let James explain. Retrofit is going to be a finite podcast series through which I hope to illuminate some of the hurdles, pitfalls of trying to be fitter and healthier. Each episode will have its own topic related to health and fitness, and most will have their own distinct guest as well. Some of these guests will be experts in a particular field that's related to the discussion at hand, but most will be friends who I think have an interesting or informative take on that episode's topic. The podcast's intended to be fortnightly to allow for questions, feedback to come in, but we'll see how that goes. It's uh, also intended to be a kind of lean 60 minutes in length to accompany a workout or a commute. Again, we'll see how that goes. Cheers, James. Okay, so after my little faux pas, I feel like a sufficient amount of karma has now been restored. So let's get chatting to James about his honourable mention. James, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you very much. It's great to have you on. Um, as we've chosen previously and shows maybe going on into time ad infinitum, uh, what, the first question I want to ask you about your honourable mention, uh, well, it's not even about your honourable mention first, <laughs> is um, in no particular order, um, what are the games you would class... Uh, the pinnacle of gaming, the games that are the top of your list. It doesn't have to. The thing is, a lot of people, I'll, I can just hear Twitter screaming at me, oh, you shouldn't be making a top 10 or a top 5 list or whatever. <laughs> so I just want to say, like, if you had some form of, I know you make lists, so yep, in your yep. lists, what are the games that are just the greatest games? You know, just to get an idea of who you are, how yeah, you yeah, think, sure. and that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it, it surely goes without saying for anyone who's heard me on a podcast or uh, interacted with me on Twitter <laughs> or whatever, um, the Souls games yeah. um, from Demon Souls right on through to Dark Souls 3 now, including Bloodborne and uh, you know all, all the others in, in that series, the five games, I guess, six if you include the, the, essentially the remake of Dark Souls 2. So um, <laughs> yeah, that series um, has just been a revelation to me over the past uh, six years or so now. Yes, yeah. it's, uh, it's been a while. Uh, it's been around. Um, but yeah, the, the other games. So uh, in in that vein, Castlevania Symphony of the Night um, is a game that I hadn't played until a couple of years ago. But yeah. that is very much of a similar kind of uh, yeah. uh, similar kind of vein in terms of it being uh, quite difficult, quite um, intensive for a third person sort of action RPG game, uh, yeah. and being very heavily exploration based and getting you know exploring to the point where you find yourself in over your head and sort yeah. of acclimatizing learning to come to terms with uh you know a step up in difficulty or a particular type of enemy um and uh, a, a sort of fairly large portion of my gaming diet is uh stealth games so right. the hitman series uh, would definitely be up, up there uh, especially at the moment with uh, the the game that came out this year being so well, it, it's so well received, but it, yeah, for me, just, just a, a complete return to form. Yeah, I was going to say um, that's really refreshed that that whole franchise, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it's uh, yeah, it's one of those weird things where, with Absolution, it felt like they were trying to cater for 
a completely different um, audience. Almost. Action audience yeah. when that's not really what the game was, which, which is fine if they want to you know do that, but it felt like it lost something of the kind of um, the playground sandbox feel yeah. that each sort of level had where you're sort of popped into an environment and you're just this um, silent, stealthy, bold force of nature moving through <laughs> it, you know, um, no matter who the target is. And, and that's what this... Uh, sort of recent refresh kind of really did take from Absolution was the contracts mode where the notion that anyone in the level can be the target um, and, and it's your job to find a way to isolate them and to, in my case, do it without, you know, touching a hair on anyone else's head if possible. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, I'm a massive fan of, of that series. Um, and, and yeah, this, this year's game has kind of brought me completely back to it after Absolution sort of... Um, Pushed me away a little bit. I think. I was going to say, yeah. I, I was going to say because mm. I've never played a Hitman game, uh, mm. and I've picked up uh, Blood Money, and I desperately want to play the new games just because you hear so yeah. many stories yeah. about it and and kind of the kind of emergent stuff that comes out of it. You just think, I think oh. that's it. Yeah, it just it does feel like you get this. Uh, it's not a realistic level, but it's incredibly detailed, mm. um, and then it is just a series of mechanics, including alert statuses. Uh, and disguises and the various tools and weapons and stuff that you can pick up, um, the various environmental tri- triggers in terms of, uh, you know, light switches or chandeliers or whatever it may be you're going to use to uh, to enact your uh, mayhem. Yeah. They all kind of come together and sometimes it goes horribly wrong and sometimes it goes horribly right, but it's <laughs> always fun to see. Uh, yeah. So yeah, definitely. I can, I can see why someone who, who likes dark, uh, like the Souls games and, you know, that kind of stuff would like that game because it's just mm. pure mechanics, isn't it? You know, it's, it, it's it not, is, the, yeah, not, the te- yeah. not the technicalities necessarily like a Souls game, but like like you say, the whole mechanics of kind of just um, uh, learning an area to the point yeah. at which yeah. you have complete control over it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the um, the first level for this year's um, game was set in Paris at a uh, party held by uh, a guy who runs a fashion show, a fashion company or a brand. Yeah. And uh, I spent twenty hours on that level alone, just going through it multiple times, unlocking all the different ways to kill uh, the target and all, all the different uh, disguises and everything. And yeah, that was in and of itself. That's the first of six levels they've uh, released. And I spent twenty hours on it. I was going to say that, it's just, the, the, the way they've released that game uh, episodically, yeah, yeah, really does benefit. Um, you, you know, like being able to create these grand environments and have yeah, them get yeah. too boring or rote. You know, you can actually yeah, go a bit crazy yeah. with each one, can't you? And that was very much the way in. Um, in uh, I guess all the games. But kind of, but absolution, um, where every level kind of was distinct and the story was a, a cutscene or a phone conversation that happened in between the levels and the odds, the odd clue or indication of something going on in the levels. But pretty much each level was standalone. So it kind of made yeah. perfect sense to, to, you know, hand each level out yeah. one at a time, um, throughout the course of this year. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a bit of a revelation for me, I've got to say. Um, okay, so come back to that, so, yeah. uh, so far, your list is seems to be just full of challenge. Um, yeah, but it's it's weird. It's um, so with like, for instance, the Metal Gear Solid series. I know uh, people have responded to that so kind of becoming more and more. Um, give the player more tools to be able to deal with being spotted. Yeah. Um, and not necessarily have it be a fail, st- fail state. Uh, and Deus Ex, Human Revolution, and Mankind Divided are the same. Right. Um, and one of the ways they do that is give you more um, more guns and, and make the shooting mechanics better and, and you know, give you the possibility of just turning it into a shooter uh, if, if you're spotted and if you're seen and if something goes wrong. Yeah. Um, but you for me... A, you have a plan B. Yeah, you have a plan B. For me, there really isn't a plan B. In all honesty, if something goes wrong, whether or not there's a fail state, I've probably reset back to the, my last save point uh, <laughs> before I even get to the the um to to that fail state, uh, just because that's not how I like to play the games. And yeah, right. okay, just sort of you know resetting your progress every time uh, isn't necessarily a fun way for a lot of people to play the game, but um, it doesn't therefore feel like challenge if you see what I mean. Yeah, I've I've already. I'm more harsh on myself than the game is almost. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, it, it never feels that way, but um, certainly, I, 
I think it does come from the stealth uh, games that I've enjoyed playing, you know, Splinter yeah. Cell and stuff as well, where I do kind of like being in a hostile environment, but not overwhelmed by, by an antagonistic force where you're kind of there and no one knows you are. And that ha- that has a sense of vulnerability and a sense of power oh. at the same time. Um, I've always, always kind of responded to that in, in games. Yeah. Um, I've got to say, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what, so, uh, what else is on your list then? Um, um, so in, in, I guess in the same sort of vein, Bioshock, I, I loved invading that kind of broken world of, of Rapture. Um, and, uh, there's nothing quite as empowering as, uh, taking a bunch of the, like the natural camouflage, uh, uh, perk or, um, tonic, um, and, and then just upgrading my wrench and electroshock abilities yeah. just so that you're just this, walking disguised invisible just absolute wrecking shop it's yeah. even on the toughest difficulties you know i'll have a grenade launcher to take on a big daddy or whatever but um just kind of specializing your character build just to be this ridiculous um so sort of marauding monster like invisible yeah monster. exactly yeah. yeah yeah well i mean they say it in the in the very first minutes of the game you know um you're given the electroshock uh, plasmid and you pick up a wrench and that's all you need for the rest of the game. You know, the, the going back to it with the recent remaster, the shooting kind of feels more ropey than ever um, <laughs> in, in that game. And I was just inclined to say, yeah, well, you know what? Shocking them and hitting them with a wrench works pretty well. Yeah. I'll stick with that quite I'll, happily. I'll so, max yeah. that way. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I guess if we're going right back to the beginning of me enjoying these uh, sort of explorative worlds where you're you're kind of set at, you know at poor odds versus the insurmountable force that you're you're up against, um, it goes back to Legend of Zelda: Link to the Past oh, uh, yeah. on Super Nintendo. It's it's right everything's everything that I love about most of those games is kind of right <laughs> there uh, in terms of you know. Uh, as I say, the exploration, but also, as I was saying with Bioshock, finding the your play style that works for you, and that even if you are kind of cheesing an enemy around the corner, you can still you can still do it. So, um, yeah. so yeah, that that kind of goes back to the start of of that for me, I guess. Fantastic, fantastic. So now we've got an idea of mm. sort of where where you're coming from. This kind of, like you say, the the challenge and the kind of you know exploration of worlds and stuff. Yeah. Um, what is the game that you've brought to us uh, as your honourable mention? So I, I had a tough time with this. I think uh, I, I said to you, I'd basically I, I've made several sort of favourites lists just every so often just to see how I'm feeling about video games and whether something drastic has changed or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, kind of having a dialogue with myself as to you know how I'm <laughs> feeling about something that's such a big part of of my life i and, felt incredibly um, like guilty like when we spoke <laughs> when we spoke about this and like you said oh no that's it i've got to go away and make a list i'm going to deliberate over it for hours like, oh no please, please so, don't <laughs> so what i ended up doing was i've kept records over time of my favorites lists again just so i can see how it's changed over time right. i just grabbed so there are a hundred games in each one and there's like six or seven of them and pasted them all into a spreadsheet so this is your incredibly it. scientific then <laughs> and, but I just started going through and thought, right, okay, anything that would make my top 10 list has to go immediately. Right. And not just would make my top 10 list now, but has made my top 10 list on any of the period of time over right. like five years that I've been making these. Wow. It has to go just because if I put it in a top 10 list at some point, it's not an honorable mention. No, is exactly. it? It's a yeah. top 10 game. So, um, so I had to kind of get rid of those. And then anything that, I just couldn't fathom coming on here and talking about it, basically. It had to be a game I felt very passionate about. Yeah. So it was kind of easy to whittle down. But then I ended up, I kept running into games that, like, they might make my top 10 list if I was just having a really weird day. Yeah. yeah. But, like, they could be interchangeable <laughs> with, like, the 10 on any one of those lists at any in any year. Yeah, yeah. But there's some, like, key reason, either because they're an odd thing that I like, but I don't get the impression that an awful lot of other people do. Right. Or there's like some clear flaws in the game that, that anyone would just have to admit. Like, See, that was, the, that was what this, this entire premise of this show was about, was, th- yeah. was those, those yeah. games. And it sounds like you've just got an absolute bucket full of them. Yeah, so I mean, there's stuff like Dear Esther, Demon Souls, uh, the original Deus Ex, 
Far Cry Two is just yeah. like it's such fits the this uh, criteria yeah. for the, to a T. Uh, and Near as well was the other one, which is yeah. like a lot of people really don't like Near, but. I just adore that game. Oh, I'm, um, gu- I'm gutted you haven't really brought that up, actually, because no, no, of this parish, Dan Clark, it, that's one of his favourite games of yeah. all time, and I would I, love someone to just <laughs> wax lyrical about it. I, I can give you some names. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know people. <laughs> uh, but So the, the reason I didn't end up picking any of those was because I kind of thought, you know what? It, Nier has certainly been in Far Cry 2, have certainly been in my top 10. Any one of those games would make my top 10 at some point or other. Yeah. So in the end, I'm putting them in because I feel like I've got an axe to grind about them, about why I like them and defending that position almost, which okay. is fine. But ultimately, if they would make my top 10, then they really can't be the game that I pick. Um, the one that I had a real tough time deciding between the game I chose and, and this one mm. uh, is Burnout Legends because... Right. that's an interesting one. It's the first Burnout game I, p- I played. Yeah. It was on PSP, PSP back in 2005, yeah. um, and I loved that game. Uh, it's only because Burnout Paradise is so darn good. Yeah. Uh, well, good as an object. You know, yeah, I love you. it so much yeah. that, um, the, uh, that it, it just would not make my top 10. And, and it's got the frailties of a handheld, you know, graphically it's a little iffy in places and it, it follows uh, a very rigid structure and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. By the time it came out, Revenge was, was coming out and it was really kind of based on the structure and style of takedown, takedown. from the year before. So it, it has a, a it's kind of a little bit anachronistic in, in that way. Yeah. Um, but just, I mean, the soundtrack of it and just that burnout feel of speed and just, again, I've said it before, actually, in regards to different, just mayhem being yeah. caused by, you know, you just slam someone into a wall and suddenly three cars go out and you just weave through them in that kind of Days of Thunder style way. Yeah. You know, you've got yeah. on your special tires and you just weave through the lot and, there's nothing, you know, you're absolutely There's nothing fun. better than that. That's the kind um, of, from take down through, like you say, Burnout Legends and through to Revenge. Yeah. And then eventually culminating in paradise, that that yeah, feel, yeah. Uh, you don't get that in any other game anymore. You um, don't, yeah, you don't. So it's, I had a real hard time, uh, but ultimately I decided. I've kind of, I've kind of had my say on burnout on Kane and Rin's. <laughs> right. I I couldn't justify bringing that on here when ultimately one what I want to say is it's fast and you crash and that's just like well that's burnout you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is and, what it is, yeah. <laughs> at a certain point that's just kind of burnout and the game that I've decided to bring is a game that to a lot of people is not representative in some ways of the series but to me it, this game is the series you know right, okay. um, I should probably say what it is yep. rather than dancing yep, around yeah, go, it, go, go, for um, it, go for it it's Super Mario Land 2 6 Golden Coins right, uh, on okay. the Game Boy wow okay. yeah <laughs> which to many people, is probably just going to be this weird oddity that yeah. is kind of a Mario game, but not what they think of in any way, shape, or form when they think of Mario. Oh, no, exactly, because you just say you think Mario reasons. and you just go straight to 1, 2, or 3, or Galaxy, or, World, or, or, World, yeah, or yeah, one of the main series kind of thing, yeah. uh, even though there's not really been an established main series and, and spin-off series, aside from like Wario Land and stuff like that. But um, at, at this point, it's... Um, it, the the land games are kind of seen as distinct, and then we had 3D Land and 3D World, which ki- kind of follow those games, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But even in amongst that lot, this one's separate. Uh, just right off the bat, when you look at um, the credits, because Shigeru Miyamoto is just not involved at all, at all. in this yeah. game, and that's, for a Mario game, pretty bizarre to, to think about. Um Especially today, when as a producer, he first it's, name oh, you would see on that list. Yeah, his hand is in everything. Game. He may not have done. He may yeah. not have done any design he may not work, be but he's overseen it. Whatever, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and in this case, it just wasn't. He had been involved in the original Super Mario Land, um, but this this time around, um, it just wasn't at all. It was it was still Nintendo R and D one, the the infamous, the famous yes. uh, Nintendo Studio, um, still a Nintendo game, but uh, directors Hiroji Kiyotake and Takehiko Hosokawa. Um, I had to look those up. I, I didn't know say, those. Really? Obviously, you surprised <laughs> <Yeah>. me. <laughs> I didn't know those off the top of my head because they're not household names to to many of us. Um, and and if to look at 
what games they've been involved in. It wouldn't necessarily stand out amongst Nintendo's uh, back catalog. You know, yeah. so so many people at these sort of legendary Japanese studios. Um, you spot their name on one game, you look back, and it turns out they've been involved in dozens of amazing, iconic games, even if they weren't, you know, head honcho, honcho on any of them or anything. Yeah, but, they've had a, they've had a uh, small hand in something, you know. They, yeah, they've yeah, never yeah, designed yeah. A, a particularly decent like level or whatever. A- absolutely, That's yeah. It, yeah. Um, and in, in this case, um, I mean, they have. Um, for Hiroji Kiyotake, he's been involved in, in Metroids, uh, in game design and uh, uh, and as director on Wario Land games that followed this one, but um, but yeah, not 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 in the way that you associate with anyone who's been involved with you know anyone who's directed a Mario game. Yeah. You know that, that should just be the, their name should be almost be synonymous with video games. It feels like, and yes. that's just not the case with with this one. It's uh, so it, yeah, it feels kind of bizarre, I suppose, to be picking this as representative of the Mario series yeah. um, when the people involved weren't the people you associate with Mario necessarily, not inherently at least. Right. Um, so that, that's kind of tick one on why right. for, for many people this isn't probably a Mario game that they would maybe even have played but certainly have thought of. Um, it came out um, back in 92, 93 we probably got it in, in uh, the UK and in Europe. Yeah. Um, but it's back in 92, so it was three years after Super Mario Land came out in the Game Boy. Yeah. Um, and Super Mario Land was very much a Game Boy version of the NES Mario games, that certainly Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. Um, but it was kind of this askew thing where each world had its own aesthetic and flavor, but they were completely disconnected from one another. Um, and you weren't, you were in Sarasa land and fighting off an alien who'd kidnapped Princess Daisy. So it's kind of this weird thing where it all feels familiar, but none of the names are the same. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not, it's, it's a not... weird side, you know, kind of like <laughs> exactly. if it was a Marvel universe, it'd be a side world. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's this alternate universe Mario type thing. Right. Okay. Um, and, and so Super Mario Land 2 picks up where that left off and you're returning to your castle and it turns out your childhood friend Wario, this is his first appearance in the Mario series, <laughs> okay. has, has taken over your castle and convinced everyone in the entire land that he is in fact in charge and you are this usurper and enemy of them and etc. It's just, it's bizarre, bizarre yeah. but it's so fun. Just in in the way that like side projects and side stories can be, because it's just completely freed from all of the trappings of what you would think of when you think of the Mario series. I mean, if you think um, about it now, um, they're even doing that with the kind of uh, the Paper Mario games at the moment and and that yeah, kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the uh, yeah. Mario and Luigi like series. You know, yeah. that they like yeah. to have fun with these kind of s- sort of offshoots, don't they? they oh have, yeah. yeah, 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 definitely, yeah, yeah, and uh, and I think that's part of. Now looking back on it, why I, I I like it, but for me, this stuff was Mario. I mean, I I was aware of and I'd, I'd played a little bit of Super Mario Brothers, uh, but it wasn't until ninety Chris probably Christmas ninety three, so um, a year after I would have got my hands on this game and started playing it before I had a Super Nintendo and had Super Mario All Stars with which to go back and play all of the original games. So, so this is this is the first kind of side question, as it were. Um, yeah. Why this game um, on a handheld? You know what? What? What drew you to this <laughs> game? Like, like you say, you've you've got the, you've mm. got the games on the console. You've played All Stars. Did did they influence your decision, or was that kind of, uh, or was it just that you'd read about this game and it was so crazy and that just drew drew you in? What was it about the game? Well, well, that's that's the thing. Um, I I got this game as soon as it came out, so it would have been you know. 1993, right. uh, a year before I had a Super Nintendo and had familiarity with the main console Mario games. So right. uh, I, I I played uh, Super Mario Brothers on uh, a NES at a friend's house for like 10 minutes. Okay. And and that, that was one of the things that prompted me to get a Game Boy in like 91 or whenever it was I got one uh, at the age of like nine years old. Um, 
and that was the Game Boy was my first encounter with console gaming because before that it had been ZX Spectrum and Commodore and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so the Game Boy was my f- my first Nintendo console. So this was your gateway to Mario. Console. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's why uh, this is Mario in many ways to right. me. I, I obviously had Super Mario Land first, but um, but th- this then was the sequel to that game, and yeah. uh, it wasn't until a year later after I'd played this and fallen in love with it um, as much as I had that I got All Stars, and then after that, right, Super okay. Mario World, and uh, you know, started to to learn more about what the the quote unquote main series was. I was but, say, that's a fantastic way because m- most people just are co- do come straight in on the home console versions, oh, and yeah, then they yeah, go yeah, to the you know, they go then to the the handheld versions, whereas mm. you've done it in completely the opposite way around. But you still have the like the deep love for it. That's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, it, to the point where um, you know, I, I'm I perfectly well understand that Super Mario Land and Super Mario Land Two, and even 3D Land and 3D World are seen as kind of the the easy versions of Mario. Yeah, because they are. I mean, you can run through Super Mario Land. Uh, I can run through Super Mario Land or Super Mario Land Two. In like an hour and a half tops, you know, if I'm taking my time <laughs> at some point, it feels like uh, not now, but if I was if I was playing it often, yeah. you know, they're they're short games, especially if you take the shortcuts and stuff, right. um, without too much trouble. Um, whereas main Mario series, it feels like to me, certainly, you know, All Stars and and World um, are a lot less forgiving of dying over and over and over again and and you know and struggling to come to terms with running and jumping as opposed to just edging forward and you know jumping and stuff like that they they kind of um i certainly struggled with them a lot more whereas these just felt much easier and more friendly in that way um and so and so to me like 3d land and 3d world the fact that some people they're almost you know baby's first mario in terms of they will just give you an item that makes the the entire level pretty easy uh, you know compared to say new super mario brothers or something which kind of evokes um the original console series uh, yeah. a bit more yeah. um but that that's what i kind of expect from mario so i'm perfectly happy with that i, I not too bothered if it's a bit easier or anything yeah. um and, and yeah so so it, it's i've kind of got this weird relationship with the game where this is mario as i understand it yeah and the main series is yeah if you enjoy that sort of thing that's fine but <laughs> i've got nothing against it but it's just not it's yeah it's, it's just not mario to me yeah, in some ways it's not it's not, not, that, it's not yeah. rela- relaxing it's like you know yeah, like yeah. you say it's not that uh you you can't just play it at your leisure you know with the, with the main ones I yeah suppose. exactly yeah, yeah like you say it's actually ironically you're going back to the your your thing of like you love a challenge and the, the games mm. on your like all time list are all challenging and very difficult and you've got to plow hours into it to learn and this almost sounds like you're, you're enjoying this simply because it doesn't challenge you too much and you can just switch off and relax and just yeah. let it flow yeah. over you sort of thing well it's it's i guess it's uh, a different type of challenge as well in that it's timing based and a little bit more reactions based in terms of running right. and jumping and you know spacing yourself properly and i'm just anything that's you know timing based i'm just hopeless at more or less <laughs> frankly right. so um there's that side of it as well where uh platformers the frustration can build up a lot more quickly for me i mean that's uh, you know I've, I've completed super meat boy and stuff but it's kind of like i completed it to the first completion level and then it's dark world or whatever and i'm like no nah, i'm not gonna manage that that's just gonna be way too frustrating so um so yeah it's kind of the same way here where yeah. it's like no these mario games I, i'm at home with i can have fun with and i know i'm not gonna get frustrated with or anything uh i'm not gonna need to to kind of struggle with to yeah. to enjoy so yeah oh, fantastic fantastic yeah. so You've you've told us about that you know you, you enjoy it because of um, it's a, I don't know a slightly more palatable version of Mario and that, mm. and that kind of thing. Um, do you have any like sort of um, I don't know sort of what what are the negative sides of this game? You said that you love it so much and you know uh, you you've been through it and it's it's easy and uh, mm. and relaxing and uh, it, it it's obviously made by Nintendo and uh, R and D one and that they're just great um, you know makers of great games. What is it about it that doesn't quite hit the mark? Why why does this keep this off your t- all time, you know, 
like you said, yeah. you've got a massive yeah, yeah, love yeah, sure, for it, yeah. and you know. Mm. So, so what is it, what is it that you, that's just not getting it onto that list for you? So the the first thing that struck me when I was replaying this uh, today is the the boss fights. Like the bosses are great, the music's fun, the animations when you you jump on the boss's head, which that's the way to defeat all of the bosses. There's none clever really about the bosses. Um, despite the fact there's some clever stuff elsewhere in the game. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, from, I, I guess most people's first boss is the tree zone boss bird. And it's literally just this boss swooping down in a U shape around the screen and you just jumping and hitting it on the head three times and that's it. Boss no. dead. And th- I mean, really simple. And the, the animation and, and the, as I said, the, the sound, um, that goes with it and the music that's playing and everything is, is all good fun. But ultimately the bosses are, for, for a Mario game where I think of bosses as being inventive or interesting in some way, um, the, their kind of bare minimum of Quite right. what ha- had to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, and there's, um, obviously the fact that it's on a monochrome screen. They yeah. do an awful lot with that, but it, it can't evoke that kind re- of, um, yeah, emotion you remember from Mario, like you, you, even for me, where I say this is Mario to me. I know Mario wears, you know, wears a red outfit and he's yeah. just not red because it's a Game Boy screen. So even if exactly. you're playing it on 3DS virtual console, um, th- there's kind of this schism between my memory of the game and then what the game actually is. So, you know, playing it back today, I was enjoying it perfectly well and, uh, and loving it, but th- it's very much tied up to my memories of the time. Yeah. Um, and not necessarily a game that I feel I could necessarily, I mean, I don't have to defend anything, but I could <laughs> defend, you know, yeah. being a great game in and of itself without my nostalgia attached to it, etc. cetera. Um, so it's definitely, definitely that. Um, so how did you find playing it on, I mean, I've, I've picked up a Game Boy I've, <laughs> from my mum. This is, this is, <laughs> this is a bit sad, but, um, my mum was clearing out a loft and had a game, had her Game Boy that had, um, what was it? I think it was Super Mario Land on it and Tetris. That was it. That was the two games she mm. had with it. And she's, she's given it to me uh, probably about six months ago. And one thing I found with the Game Boy is I just, yeah. A, I didn't realise how large it was and how just <laughs> incredibly tricky that, that, that is to handle and, and use and play with. Yeah. So does that hamper your experience and, and so, that kind of just the ergonomics of being able yeah, to physically yeah, play it on a, on a, on a handheld? Well, and bear in mind, obviously, when I was playing this, I was now, well, I was 10 years old. Yeah. Um, so my hands were a lot smaller. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so it's got this weird thing because, and, and the Game Boy at the time wasn't particularly overly large. You know, you think of Game Gear and Atari Lynx oh, yeah. and stuff. It's like, no, the Game Boy was pretty compact. And obviously, like, you know, uh, Game Boy Advance and beyond, you know, uh, all kind of became more ergonomic and, uh, you know, they went for the widescreen format, if you like, you know, the elongated format, yeah. whereas this is quite narrow and tall and your hands are quite tight together. Yeah, exactly. um, Which, ironically, you will be doing with the Switch pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's a weird thing. And the screen's actually always smaller than I remember. Yeah. Uh, whenever I, I see, um, my mum's my actually got my Game Boy. She's a bit of a Tetris nut, so she's had that for decades now. What is it about Tetris um, and mums? <laughs> there, there's, there's something, if you could harness it. I, yeah, I honestly do not know. There's a Russian genius somewhere who exactly. had the formula, but no one else has captured it. That's it, uh, it's bottled think. somewhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the screen's actually smaller than you remember because there was quite a, a big sort of grey... Uh, border around it as well yeah. so that your your memory of the screen will undoubtedly be as mine as I imagine uh, that that it's bigger than it really is um, but that that definitely wasn't problematic in terms of it's chunkier than what we had now but at the time as I say it was actually pretty compact yeah. uh, it didn't feel overly chunky or ridiculous you know it felt about you know it felt still like a marvel that you could have essentially all of these games in your hand in the car with you when you went on holiday and stuff you know yeah um, and, uh, and with this game in particular, uh, more than any that I can think of on the Game Boy, actually, um, that little screen felt like this window onto just this giant world. Right. Okay. Um, 
because this game, uh, in the way that Super Mario Land was kind of like the Game Boy's version of Super Mario Brothers, this was the Game Boy's version of Super Mario Brothers 3 or Super Mario World in that you had a, a world map to wander around. So it felt like all of these still as, as bizarrely themed and disconnected zones were brought together and actually given context in a in a world, if you like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I ergonomically, uh, it it just felt like a marvel to have all of these levels connected by this world and this little window that you look through in between your hands in, on your lap. You know, when you were sat, you know, in the doctor's waiting room or wherever you might be, that you were able to take your Game Boy with you and just you know to have that, as I say, window into into this uh, just albeit monochrome but vibrant world um which kind of leads into talking about i guess the the aesthetic of it because um super mario land was very much everything is made of like five pixels yeah um so mario was just a grouping of pixels that looked like vaguely humanoid but i'm sure my memory of it is generous to be honest yeah. um and 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 the the wonderful thing they did with Super Mario Land Two was they realized that okay we've only got one color of pixel and everything else is this sort of green background or or you know white if you want to that's it say, say what it is and that's how it is on virtual yeah, they, console they now, don't but, have a palette full stop yeah exactly they've got nothing to work with so what they did was say well okay yeah everything has to be made out of pixels but instead of Mario being just a solid group of pixels. Mario can be the space between pixels, the space described by a group of pixels. So you can have Mario is now the negative space. And yeah. and so the it just felt like this massive leap forward in terms of what they were able to do with their artwork because they just said, okay, like on an Etch-A-Sketch, yeah. you don't have to colour everything in. You can leave negative space yeah, you, and you can see do- that, you know, and, and see... Uh, a yeah. lot of detail in that. As I well, have so. that a lot when, um, like, where I work. I work. I work for like a marketing company doing some mm. of artwork and design and stuff. And having to draw the the one real test is to draw like um, a a one color line art sort yeah. of logo. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and how you can define shapes, uh, like you say, with that negative state space and stuff, and, yeah. and still get yeah. like, re- and especially on that kind of screen to get that kind of definition and that sort of um, Mario. Uh, three Super Mario three kind of like style. It it really felt like it compared to you know what they done with Super Mario Land. It felt like this is like the consoles. You know it did. Yeah. I don't. Know, it, it shouldn't have really because it it still was monochrome, but it just felt so much more detailed. That's what you say. Um, that, yeah, yeah, just that that thought process to kind of ha- how do I make this sort of like you say how do I define this shape without yeah you yeah. know w- without losing something and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, crazy. Absolutely. It's absolutely crazy. Th- th- that was the way games worked then. You know, yeah. um, several times for ser- several different games, we've talked about the restrictive um, sound chips that were available on Super Nintendo and and certainly on Game Boy. Goodness, yeah, yeah, very much. Uh, so. and, and anything beforehand, or the the restrictive um, memory sizes and stuff they had to work with. And what you find is with those restrictions, um, smart people, and undoubtedly the people making these games yeah. were smart will find ways to be endlessly creative and those restrictions instead of being this problem to overcome become d- almost the the paintbrush in your hand yeah and, they become the defining so characteristic of an entire game don't they um yeah, yeah and it's it's just amazing to see you know uh and and for sound you know since playstation one era i guess when cd sound was available um, you know, stereo dyna- stereo sound essentially was yeah. was available with a, with a full repertoire of of sound that you would get from any hi fi. It always um, amazes me when you go back to a PS one game and you think, oh my god, the graphics have dated so much. But then you hear the sound, the sound, yeah, and then yeah. the sound is it's not really that much different to as it is yeah. now. It's, yeah. yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. a very odd juxtaposition between the two. And and it's and so that that for sound is a very clear you know distinction where. A few years before, you had very limited sound chips, and and you know the sound sets that were available were dependent upon the cartridge in the Super Nintendo. That's it, yeah. You know they had created a subset of all the sounds that were available from Super Nintendo, and that subset was your palette for that game, and that's all you had to work with. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly you had orchestral 
you know, uh, scores available to you and you could do anything you wanted, um, which is great. And it's amazing to be able to do that. But the things that were done with the restricted tool set are, are in their own way, just as amazing. No, exactly. Um, it's that and, Star Wars argument, isn't it? Of like, they, they had yeah. to go out and build the sets. They, they were restricted yeah. to that. They couldn't yeah. use CG. So they had to yeah. find interesting yeah. camera angles to hide things, which actually yeah. then became yeah. iconic and, that's what this game sort of sounds like it is for you in in kind of a way. Oh, very much. Yeah. I mean, to, to any, to anyone who's listening to me talking about it and, and isn't aware of this game, uh, and, and maybe is a bit younger and doesn't have an awareness of what Mario originally was to, to go from something like, uh, Mario Galaxy or a Mario 3D world and to go back and look at this on a Game Boy. It must sound like I'm just off my rocker. <laughs> it really, but it really must to, you yeah, know, to yeah. hear, uh, Chris talk about, uh, you know, Spectrum games and stuff like that and, and BBC, uh, micro games, um, on, yeah. on the show you did with him. It must just sound bizarre for people who are used to Assassin's Creed being a world that you can go and explore Absolutely. to talk about, you know, me talking about a little map where you're going to get to choose your levels instead of a menu or What's whatever. What's lovely about the, like this game, like that game, the game you've picked today and uh, say Chris's game uh, yeah. on, on the um, spectrum and the BBC is that you did so much more filling in of detail in your mind. Yeah. You know, like you yeah. say on, on this like Super Mario Land, you couldn't see the colours, but in your mind you filled those in. Yeah. You know, the shades yeah, yeah. of grey, yeah. you just knew that yeah. that was a yellow and that was a red and you kind of just accepted that and got on with it. And kind of, yeah. it's a very um, childlike, you know, like it's sort of childlike play kind of situation. Yeah. And I, I, I love that. Perfect example of that is whenever you jump on an enemy's head in this game, uh, if it's a boss, they'll flash. But essentially all they do is just squash right, the yeah. character and play like a, a funny, like slapstick humour sound like a noise (laughs) and and your brain does all the filling in of what actually happens there and so i'm i I talk in you know i've put some notes together for it and i've written down like the animations are really cool they're really good and there's lots of character in them probably they're not probably it's actually just goes from this sprite i guess to this sprite and plays a funny sound make 20 percent yeah yeah take from 100 to 20 percent make sound you know yeah exactly yeah yeah um, which I mean, animations are just having having several stages of yeah, that exact yeah, thing, and, and, and you know, yeah, 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 um, or or that's what the the first sort of stages of it were. But um, but yeah, this game feels cartoonish and vibrant in a way that a monochrome Game Boy game shouldn't be able to feel. Right. Uh, it, and again, a lot of that's my memory. But uh, but yeah, it just it it just did stuff that I didn't think was possible on a Game Boy is the only way I can describe it. And yeah. and whenever you say that about a film or um or a game or whatever, you know, if they're able to transcend the either the medium they're in or the technical limitations in terms of video games are often uh quite similar to that. It it just does kind of blow your mind. There's a reason that's a, a phrase. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe overused, but I, I think when we're talking about the one game that we would pick as an honourable mention, I think it's fair it's you know, it's reasonable to say that we're picking it because it yeah. did kind of blow, blow your mind a bit. Yeah, so, yeah. It's inter- it's interesting to see that, that of of the people I spoke to so far, there's just there's an intangible something that, that someone keys in on and and that's the thing for them and 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 that's the thing that they absolutely adore about the game but they can but also like they they you can see you can see the fault in 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 the game but it doesn't matter because that one thing is so 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 solid yeah and i think that's what it sounds like on this game it's a mario game it is just i mean i'm I'm assuming i don't want to put like words in your mouth but i'm assuming this just feels exactly just like any other Mario game, it just feels right. Uh, I mean, yeah, it does to me. I'm, I'm sure uh, people who uh, are aficionados of quote yeah. unquote the main series um, w- m- might be able to point to stuff about you know uh, with different eras of Mario game, the physics is slightly different. Yeah, but yeah. as Ma- long as yeah. it feels right, that's Super okay, Mario Maker kind of shows you that, doesn't exactly, it? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, perfect example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but I mean, there's so there's stuff in this game like it is much smaller than I remember. There are um, six zones each with, uh, I think five levels and then the w- Wario's Castle end. So there's like 32 levels in the game or something. It's it, not a big game whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and, and also 
there's an underwater level and a level where you're floating through jelly and a level where you're floating through space where clearly all they've done is just tweak the gravity, you know, whatever the equivalent of the gravity setting in the in the game was for that level. Yeah. Um, so it's really simple in many ways. You know, a lot of the stuff that I would say, like the jelly, for example feels ingenious to me like as a kid i remember just like i jumped into the jelly and you hang for a second and then start slowly falling and i was just like my god this is amazing because <laughs> as soon as you come out of the jelly the gravity goes back to normal so it's not like an underwater level where for the whole level it's changed and even when you're like you're sliding down a jelly column and you're half in and half out you move quicker than when you're fully in the jelly and stuff like that right. it's just stuff like that was just mind-blowing to me and looking back at it now it's kind of quaint and yeah bit simplistic and actually there's not that much to this game uh but at the time it was just no th- this is amazing that i can hop into jelly and then i can sort of blub my way through it yeah as i go along yeah. essentially indefinitely um but it was just yeah it was incredible to think there's a jelly world i can go into the jelly world you know uh, <laughs> it's just you, you know that childlike wonder you have yeah. when you're nine, ten years old, and and at that stage, in spe- everything you're experiencing about video games is the first time you've ever experienced. Yeah, it. and it's the most amazing so, experience as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, a lot of this, when you talk about this game, it it, it just radiates out of you that you've just got yeah. this incredible. It's it's almost as though the nostalgia is is blowing this game up bigger than it maybe possibly is like you say it's oh, a yeah. short, it's a short it's, game there are yeah, issues with yeah. sound and the graphics and kind of you know it's it's slightly uh a slightly more dumbed down mario game and stuff but definitely like i say so could you could you sell do you think that you could sell this to someone if if someone came around to you and said okay i know about uh the, the great mario games and and now you're telling me about super mario land 2 you know how, how do you convince someone that this is the game that they should try you know can you do do you think you can do that without the nostalgia factor can you get could you could you skirt around that and still sell this to someone yes (laughs) but i'd have to be a really i'd have to be a A really skilled wordsmith actually no i'd have to be a really mean sort of marketing person like super mario 3d world was sold to people on the basis of cat mario right okay yeah, I was going to buy that game anyway. I loved 3D Land. 3D World was like, yeah, this on a Wii U, I'm in all the way. But Fantastic. when that game came out, there were so many pictures of Cat Mario was so cute. Cat Mario, you know, there's all that sort of stuff because yeah. it was cats and the internet and Mario, obviously. <laughs> this game has Bunny Mario in it for crying out loud. Right, okay. And you you pick up a carrot uh, and it's this dinky little which you call it Chantenay carrot type thing, like tiny little thing that yeah. sits on top of the blocks the way that any of the power ups do. And Mario just sprouts a couple of floppy bunny ears sticking out the top of his head. And literally all it does is mean you can hover a little bit because you're flapping your ears. Right, but okay. it's bunny Mario. It, it's giving you the Luigi jump, yeah, or the, or the Yoshi, yeah, Yoshi jump, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, in, and if you hammer jump, you kind of float a little bit more. You know, you can kind of right. glide a little bit. Um, <laughs> which, again, it has been seen in other Marios. Um you know, like this game has Fire Flower Mario, but they have to put a feather in his cap because you can't see the difference because there's no colour Because they difference. can't colour change. Yeah, exactly. Right. But Bunny Mario is like, this game has Bunny Mario. That is just, you yeah. know, you eat a carrot and you turn into a bunny and you can kind of float a little bit and it makes a weird noise when you do it. And it's just, yeah. It's, it's interesting to, to see that they've, they've obviously gone with the uh, silhouette idea. Like just just yeah. keep changing the silhouettes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's and fantastic. and and that's the thing with this. They don't have color to be able to change. They don't have subtlety. Yeah. They have to just do something obvious. So yeah, yeah you know, feather in the cap or bunny Mario. Um, and I guess the other selling point of this game is it's the first game that Wario was in. Yeah, and that character spawned an entire you know series of his own and and spin off series of his own, and is a mainstay in Smash or or uh, Mario Kart or whatever. You know, that's a character people know and. I think most people love. He certainly doesn't get the hate while yeah. Luigi gets. <laughs> so, no, exactly. <laughs> but uh, and this is where he started. And uh, in terms of story, I think it's it's actually as good as any other Mario game. <laughs> you know, they're never intricate stories. No. But uh, but this it captures that thing that I think probably all Mario's do, but the great Mario's in my mind do, which is just feels like it's bursting with ideas. Right. Um. 
so yeah, I, th- yeah. I think you could, on the basis of Bunny Mario, Wario, and it feeling like a mini Super Mario World. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think you could sell this to someone. Certainly on 3DS Virtual Console for five ninety nine or whatever it is, or three ninety nine. I Yeah, I think you can sell this to someone Okay, so as, two, as a way to spend an afternoon. So two two sub-questions then, off, off of mm. the back of that then. Does this game do the thing that everyone seems to be talking about at the moment with, with Mario games, which is it, it doesn't outstay its welcome? Like, that it it's always doing something different in each level that kind of keeps you hooked you know like like the galaxy mm. thing where it's you know one minute they're playing with gravity the next minute they're you're riding a you're riding a ball and you're you're controlling it in a different way does this, does this do that same thing is this an early progenitor of that kind of design philosophy yeah i i think it does it's just that it's not able to do it, it as does, i say yeah. it, it, it kind of plays with gravity in two or three different ways but ultimately you're still just running and jumping around. Um, and there's levels where you're kind of climbing up the sky yeah. and they'll put in platforms that move and platforms that drop. So it's, it it doesn't do something revolutionary every single level no. uh, and then discard it. But it certainly keeps you on your toes where every level feels a bit different and right. every level there's a different type of enemy or a different type of something thrown into the mix. Okay. Um, and it, it also does weird stuff um, with the way the coins work it's not 100 coins and you get a one up um you you essentially bet the coins to get one ups and oh, okay. at the end of the levels you ring a bell instead of touching a flag and that takes you to this little sort of conveyor belt claw game where you drop oh. down and get three up instead of you know um getting the flag and just wandering to the end so so they've tried to tie in the kind of japanese betting it, you know, a, love yeah of betting. A, it, it's just got different stuff in it so yeah. i suppose in, the whole game kind of feels like that a little bit but not maybe to the degree of i mean 3d land and 3d world completely blew me away in that respect where they would just pick up a new mechanic for two levels and then it's gone yeah. never see it again um so yeah. not not the, to this that game's degree probably just a little bit too as, short to, to it's kind a little of, bit too short a little yeah. bit too simple to really get into that right. kind of game changing Mario design uh type okay. situation. But but I think it does in its own way. I certainly got that kind of feeling from it. Yeah. Fantastic. And then the second sub question is Yeah. If you for whatever reason and you're mad, wanted to um <laughs> do like a kind of retrospective on Wario and find out about his characterization through the years. <laughs> does does is Wario a completely different guy in this to what he has ended up being in, like sort of, you know, like your Wario wears and your, you know, your, your big games now. Um, Is I, it, I I think Wario has been pretty much the same character all along in that he's he's just this guy who desperately wants to get one over on Mario. I I don't think Wario ever like he, he has designs on mustache twirling designs on taking over the world. Yeah, but not in like a Bowser way. No, it kind of feels to me like no, he he actually just wants to be a dick. To he just wants to get one over on Mar- Mario. So, li- so this game, like, literally, is the start of Wario, and he has never changed, and he is just the, the, the same guy. And this is the kind of you know, blueprint for what he would become. I, I think there are probably people who are more qualified than me who've played all of the Wario Land and all yeah. of the WarioWare games and stuff. But in my, with my understanding of the character, it, it yeah, it didn't didn't vastly change after this game uh, this game i mean this game sets him up as a childhood friend of mario who's a bit teed off that mario gets all the plaudits and has oh, the right. castle so mario goes away to somewhere else and he just decides yeah i'm gonna steal your castle exactly. it's literally as simple as that i love that and w- when you go into the castle as well it's the only way i can explain it is when you go into like um yeah when you go into one of the castle levels with lava everywhere and stuff in in a 3D world, or even in in the the tracks on um, Mario Kart or whatever, where it just feels like this, just almost uh, haunted house of traps and yeah. moving platforms and spike pits and stuff like that. It just it it has that aspect of Wario's personality where it's just quirky it's and strange, challenging and yeah. quirky and strange and and weird and just dickish for the sake of being dickish <laughs> the number of times i got to that i got into that castle and i was just like oh damn it just you know yeah. that was the one bit where it was like no this is actual challenge this is actual you know this yeah. is still you know a bit difficult um 
and yeah, it it's just that character is great for that That's reason. Brilliant. You know, Wario just for being a yeah, just being completely random. And yeah, just be, yeah, being annoying for the sake of being annoying and yeah. just you know uh, malevolent, yeah. but not in a yeah, the yeah, kind not, of, yeah, yeah, the agent not in a malicious way. Almost yeah. it feels like just yeah, just uh, absolutely yeah, yeah, crown prince of mischief, I guess. Fantastic. <laughs> Anyways, just for the sake of it. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah, fantastic. So. Honestly, you bring in this game, it's just brilliant like to have that little curio in, in the Mario yeah. world that you kind of yeah kind of have overlooked or, you know, just never really sort of um engaged with in any way. And it's Yeah, yeah, it's it's weird because we covered uh, back in volume three on Kane and Rince, we covered um what Leon and Tony kind of decided uh I, I rightly, uh, yeah. uh, I think, uh was the main Mario series. So um Super Mario Brothers 2, Lost Levels 3, Super Mario World and World 2, Yoshi's Island, um, and then 64, Sunshine, Galaxy, Galaxy yeah. 2, and then the new Super Mario Brothers series, which were kind of bringing back the original side-scrolling Super Mario Brothers style yeah. of, of gameplay. Um, well, I suppose that's also worth saying is that uh, this game was the last side-scrolling 2D Mario game until New Super Mario Brothers. Okay. Um, because you know, uh, three and world had already been released by that point. Um, we, we covered all of those on on volume three, and I'd encourage anyone to go and listen to those for a, a great uh, sort of overview and history of that series. Um, and and very specifically, um, I I asked, will we get to cover land? And uh, and Leon again, rightly I think said. Uh, land, land two, and then going into Wario Land, yeah. and then 3D Land and and 3D World, kind of have to be tackled separately because they are so different in so many ways, um, and so distinct in so many ways, and yeah. also it would be unwieldy to cover all of those. Yeah, would... see, from everything you've told me today, that's totally the right move to make. Yeah, because I think it's so. yeah, because like you say, there's, there's there's so many little nuggets and and interesting pieces in this that, like you say, you couldn't. It's it's very difficult with these kind of things, especially with Nintendo, because like you have the whole sort of Zelda thing as well with the Hyrule Historia, and that gets into a tangled, it, tangled yeah, mess. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the it's the same with these games. You've got you've yeah. got to draw the line somewhere, I guess. But, but but that that being said, that also leaves the door open to <laughs> run a, a sort of Mario Land into Wario Land series on yeah. Kane and Rince at some point That'd as be well. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, which yeah, exactly as you say, I think it is possible to go through and look at Wario as a character through yeah. these games. Uh, because Super Mario Land is essentially kind of uh, not a prequel, but a, a precursor, a build-up. Yeah. Because the boss at the end of that game, you end up fighting in Super Mario Land Two, and Wario obviously comes into that. So uh, yeah, I think that runs through as almost a Wario series. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Which would be really cool to do. Yeah, really I, cool. I think because that's kind of as you say, this a skew version of not just the character, but the series as a whole. Yeah, just that, this yeah. kind of weird. <laughs> What would have happened if you know, the alternate timeline? If Wario was really the the hero of Nintendo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for bringing this game. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, so I'm going to leave you with one last question, which is mm-hmm. the one that I always blindside people with. And if you could have anyone come on this show, anyone you like, um, to basically tell me about their honourable mention game, who would it be? Whew. Um, you see, I, I've got two people in mind. Right. One of whom, I actually, one of whom would be a yeah. Just go and ask this person. Yeah. He will want to do this, and <laughs> like like Chris has just this encyclopedic knowledge of video games. Yeah. Uh, and obviously a long history with them, longer than than mine certainly. Uh, and so for him, it'd just be like I'd just love to know what ridiculously obscure game just popped out of his brain yeah exactly okay um well you can give me the two names it doesn't have to be that that's leon cox who obviously obviously uh, obviously runs or is one of the three guys who created kane and rinse uh and i've gotten to know a bit but it's kind of like one of the situations where in kane and rinse we don't talk about ourselves all that much so you don't necessarily get a a feeling for our yeah, so personalities it's, aside it's from how to we respond to a game on the computer game show the other day, and just exactly, to be yeah, Leon yeah. from back in the Game Adult days, <laughs> and not kind of Leon the the Kane and Rince guy. From Kane and Rince, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so from that point of view, it's it's just like even 
working with him for five years yeah. now on on cane rinse, I'm sure he'd still surprise me on what he picked. Uh, and and I I can't imagine he wouldn't have a fantastic time coming on here, uh, you know, with you. So uh, that's the one where it's like, yeah, that's a lock for surely well, at some point. That just makes sense. Well, next time we're on with him, put a word in, you know. I'll I'll definitely put a word. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely will. So who's the other um, one then? The the other one yeah. uh, is the creator of two of my favourite games, one of which I did mention earlier, right. uh, the other of which is Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, right. the third game in that series, and up there is one of my favourite stealth games of all time. Um, the other game he created was Far Cry 2, um, right. which I, I mentioned earlier, uh, is Clint Hawking, yes. who... People look at Far Cry 2 and say, well, this doesn't kind of work. This surely isn't the way they intend... I am 99% sure that game works exactly as intended. Aside from stuff that's obviously bugs, like stuff like weapons jamming and malaria and just the way that that game presents a world that is just an affront to every sensibility that you have as a gamer looking to play a first-person shooter. Uh, It makes your life difficult in ways that feel unfair or infuriating and... I am relatively sure that's exactly what he did. There's a lot of stuff in that um, game and, and yeah. games subsequently that he's made that kind of they're intentional barriers yeah. to create interest and like you say, like to to ju- to just throw you off. Yeah. You know, and yeah. 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 And and so as we've said boy. for for um for me where I lo- I love games that set up Here's your mechanics. Let's see what comes out of these mechanics just hitting each other and bouncing off each other and creating mayhem. Yeah. Stealth games and a game like Far Cry 2 just epitomize that. Uh, you know, certainly a stealth game like Chaos Theory. Uh, and so I, I'd love to hear him talk about not just what his favorite games were and, you know, and why the one he would pick would differ from them. I'm gonna say, yeah. uh, but It'd be interesting to see what like what pick. inspired yeah. him and in, in his <laughs> game making, but then to find out yeah, like you say, like just yeah. just what what interests a guy like that who has very unique ideas on, on how games should yeah, be played. Just and different, how, how different to mess takes with the on what makes and, yeah. it an interesting experience for, yeah. for people. Uh and, and accepts that a portion of the audience are not going to enjoy some of the design choices that he yeah. makes. Fantastic. Um, what a great yeah. that's, that'd be a great get. I think that'd just and, and that'd just be a, a really cool guy to chat to at any time. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. That, that again, two two. No, thank you. thank you. Thank so you. um yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And as I say in all these My I absolute pleasure. I have no idea how to finish these things, so I will speak to you again very, very soon. <laughs> Will do indeed. Thank Bye. you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, here we are at the end of the episode. And I just want to say a big thank you to James for agreeing to be my guest and bringing such an intriguing choice for his honourable mention. Don't forget, you can listen to more from James at the excellent Cane and Rinse and Retrofit podcasts, which both can be found on iTunes. If you've enjoyed this or any other episode, please do leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any feedback on this or any other episode, please do get in contact with me on Twitter at ch4zzee or via email at email at theaiobots.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>